This meeting is being recorded. Yeah, Bismillah uh, uh, Today our session is uh, on complex EWA and uh, Dr. Sohail Choksi is going to uh, deliver his talk. Dr. Choksi did his MBBS from University of London uh, from 1986 to 1992. Then he completed his training as a registrar from uh, North General Hospital. He's working as a vascular surgeon at uh, Colchester Hospital University NHS Foundation. He is very prominent vascular surgeon and very keen for teaching and, um, and, and training the uh, vascular surgeons. He's also a program director of abdominal aortic aneurysm screening for five viewers. Uh, I had uh, uh, opportunity to work with him as a, as a, a fellow and it was a great honor for me. I learned a lot from him. He is uh, especially, uh, his areas of uh, uh, specialties are EWAR, complex EWAR, and also uh, uh, complex lower leg re uh, revascularization. So I thought it is great uh, uh, time for all of us to listen to him, his experience and uh, his wisdom, how to do the complex EWAR. So it is great to have some introduction. Maybe I can start from Dr. Free, and uh, then we can go people who can actually introduce themselves. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Zia. Uh, I'm Farid Emachek. I'm working as, a, uh, as an assistant professor in vascular surgery at AKU. And I was uh, primarily uh, trained at AKU as a general surgery resident and then as a vascular fellow. And uh, I had an opportunity of appearing in first FCPS of vascular. And I also had an opportunity of working with Mr. Choksi, as Dr. Seha said, for his training part. And it was a great time. I think I would ever remember it for my rest of life. Thank you. And then we can go to Professor Iqbal Khan. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> sir, we can add Lisa, you please unmute. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Iqbal Khan. I'm a professor of surgery at Shifa uh, International Hospital and the vice chancellor of Shifa Tamir Emirates University, Islamabad. Uh, currently, I'm also in the clinic, the vascular clinic now. And I have an opportunity to hear, inshallah, you. So, thank you, sir, for your introduction. And uh, thank you for participating and coming and, and giving your precious time. That is great honor for us. You are joining us. And then we go to Dr. Nadeem Ahmed Sheikh. Dr. Nadeem Ahmed Siddiqui, sir. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I am Nadeem Ahmed Siddiqui. I am a vascular surgeon at Arafan Hospital. And really looking forward to hear what Dr. Chosky has to say. He has always delivered us amazing talks. So looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Nadi. Usman Jamil and uh, this Dr. Fahad Mehman. Dr. Usman. Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Usman Jamil. I am currently working as a fellow in uh, vascular uh -huh. surgery in uh, CMS Lahore. I'm nearly done with my training, currently doing my rotations in uh, interventional radiology in CMH Pindi. Uh, I look forward to this session and learning about uh, this uh, disease and the interventional manage management of it. Thank you. Thank you. That is great. Uh, is Dr. G, Dr. Fahad Mehman, you want to uh, I'm Dr. Fahad Mehman. I'm currently working as a uh, fellow at uh, Trauma Center. I've done with my general surgery training from the Civil Hospital Karachi and currently about to complete my fellowship in the vascular surgery from the trauma center, Civil Hospital Karachi. Okay. And then we have Dr. Shweb and Dr. Amar Pizada. G. Shweb. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Shweb. Uh, currently doing uh, as a, working as a fellow in uh, vascular surgery in Agafal University, Karachi. I did my general surgery from JPMC, uh, Karachi. Thank you, uh, Shweb. G. Dr. Amar is another fellow working with us. G. Amar. Uh, you cannot listen, G. Amar. Hello. G. G. 
sorry sir. Uh, so uh, I'm Dr. Amar. I'm about to complete my fellowship in vascular surgery uh, from AKU under the current supervision of Dr. Zia, Dr. Nadim, and Dr. Fari. Uh, really looking forward to this lecture uh, because of uh, endovascular exponent of this uh, series. So really looking forward to this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Elias is working as a vascular surgeon in Lahore, but it is good if Dr. Elias introduce himself. Sound, sir. Hi, Zia. How are you? Fine. Kick task, sir. Up, sir. Yeah. Good, good to see you, Suhail, uh, and good to see you with uh, such a complex uh, topic. Hopefully, yeah. we'll learn a lot from you. I am a Dr. Elias Sadek, work at Doctor's Hospital. Uh, I'm trained from uh, Ireland, lived in Ireland for a good few years. And now we have started a vascular training as well. Uh, we are a second center in Lahore uh, to start the vascular training uh, of FCPS. And uh, looking forward to learn from Suhail. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Elias. Very good. Dr. Aisha Masood. Can you come, sir? I'm Dr. Aisha from CMH uh, Rawal Pindi. I am the fellow in the vascular surgery here. So the <clears throat> topics looks amazing. So I hope I would understand much about endovascular aortic repair and different oh. new techniques. You are most, most welcome. Aisha. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Dr. Madhya Ali. Madhya, you would ask. Uh, gee, Dr. Zia, thank you for the introduction. Um, I am uh, Dr. Madhya Ali. I am working as a fellow in trauma and GI surgery at Aachen University Hospital and uh, was very keen to attend this lecture, so I'm here. Yeah. Thank you. And then we have uh, uh, Dr. Ariba Salim. G. Ariba, can you introduce to the group? Ariba is having some problem. Then we have Dr. Nasser and uh, Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Nasir, vascular fellow from Doctor Hospital Lahore. Um, nice to sir, see you all. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ariba. Thank you for that. And Dr. Nasir is working as a doctor's hospital. And then we have very uh, uh, fortunate that we have Dr. Khalid Makhdoumi and also Dr. Umar Ehsan with us. But uh, it is good for Dr. Khalid if you can introduce to the junior yourself. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Khalid Makhdoumi and uh, I graduated from Dharma Medical College a very long time ago. And then uh, in the UK and worked in the UK for uh, until 9, 2015 as a consultant vascular surgeon, and uh, then moved to uh, UAE. So I'm in Abu Dhabi at the moment, uh, Alain oh. Abu Dhabi. Oh, thank you. G. Dr. Umar, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zia. Uh, thank you for arranging uh, this um, talk by Dr. Sohail, uh, who's got an uh, immense experience in dealing with complex aortic uh, aneurysm. Uh, I'm Dr. Umar Hassan. I'm a vascular surgeon at Shifa International, uh, which is a training center. Uh, and um, Alhamdulillah, we are doing, um, well, we are trying to do um, a reasonable number of uh, endovascular aortic procedures. Uh, we've got, uh, we've done approximately uh, between 20 to 25 endovascular aortic procedures, including one uh, fenestrated uh, <clears throat> EVAR for uh, uh, renal aneurysm. Uh, the problem that we have uh, over here is obviously number one expertise uh, in doing these complex things and number two, the cost. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Choksi, we can start. People will join uh, uh, in between. And, yeah. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and honor of being, you know, in such, such inter enlightened company. And I hope that I can do it justice. And, and I think I'll be learning from you as well as you're learning from me. So it's a two-way process. I just wanted to quickly check. Uh, you can see this slide. Is that OK? Should I just, is it yeah. moving OK? Is that uh, fine? OK. We're on the, it says, 
It is not moving. moving. It is not moving actually. Okay. Is it still on? What is it? Is it on the first slide? Complex yeah, it is. Eva. Yeah, it is. If I, if I go to the next one, can you see this one? Complex and your standard Eva cannot be used. No. No, not yet. Fine. Okay, not to worry. Sometimes it does that. Don't worry. Yeah. We'll just do it this way. Okay. Yeah, can you not, see it now? Yeah, but I can see it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about complex aneurysms, and I'm going to try to. Um, I'm not trying to push endovascular aneurysm repair or fenestrated aneurysm repair because, you know, in the UK, as you know, with the nice guidelines, um, you know, really open repair is preferred for those patients who are fit enough to have it. So I would still say that open repair is is very much, uh, you know, a very a good option for the patient if they're fit. But I'll just tell you about something I have done quite a reasonable amount and I wanted to share my experience. And these are the, the type of aneurysms that I deal with are sort of often juxtarenal aneurysms, a bit like this one, where the, there's a very short neck or no neck, or the aneurysm may even you know, creep up above the renals and go into the sort of visceral area. So these are native aneurysms. Um, but sometimes we deal with patients who've had an open repair in the past and they've got an aneurysm uh, you know, below, you know, above the graft, like this patient who had an open repair some years ago, many years ago, and has got an aneurysm uh, above the, you know, above the actual graft. Um, or this one in which there's an endovascular repair where the, the, the stent actually is just slipped down. And, uh, you know, in those patients, again, these are candidates for a fenestrated or complex repair as well. And I'm going to talk Mainly, mainly about fenestrated repair, but I'll also talk a bit about other types of complex repair, just to give you an oversight, overview. Um, this is a typical type of patient. I am hopefully going to be doing this case, you know, in I think it's in a month's time. Uh, There's a lady who was found incidentally to have a, a large aneurysm, seven and a half centimeters. She's actually quite fit and well. She's 80 one, 82 now. Um, she did very well on a CPEX. Anaerobic threshold was 10.8. Um, you know, she had uh, you know, good echocardiogram. So, you know, there's an argument actually that we could have, you know, done an open repair on this patient. Um, and, and this is actually the, the CT for this patient is, is this one, where the aneurysm comes right up to the renal. So, um, this is the type of patient that I often, you know, will you know, we'll be operating on. And I think it's very important with to recognize that fenestrated aneurysm repair, there's no golden sort of um, uh, randomized controlled trial that you can point to that, you know, sort of says that it's better or worse than an open repair. Yes, some series have shown that, you know, it is better, some have, or survival wise, some have shown it's worse. But I think, I think that, I personally believe if you don't have to cross clamp, then you know that definitely should have an impact on mortality. So why, why bother? Why not just try to put a standard EVA into most patients? We do in most cases, but when the when the neck isn't good, then that's when we have a problem. And this this is just some data uh, from a few years ago in which they just did a a review. Um, and you know the, the rupture rate from this real world data showed that the aneurysm rupture rate after an EVA, after you know a number of years, was 5.4 percent, which is which is actually quite high. Um, so, and, and the main reason really why that is is because of non-compliance with IFU. When you don't follow the IFU, you start getting um, problems and you start getting endo leaks. And this is again, just some data from the study, uh, which showed that when patients had, you know, conservative IFU, in other words, they stayed within IFU, the sac enlargement was only 42%, but when the IFU was, um, uh, you know, sort of interpreted liberally, then it was nearly 70%. So there is, it does make a difference. And these, the hostile neck uh, is, is really what I'm talking about here. Um, a neck that isn't suitable for a, for a standard EVA. Um, it may, may well be suitable for an open repair, but it's not suitable for an EVA because the difference between EVA and open is that for, 
for Eva, you, you need a neck of some kind. Um, and if you don't have that neck, then you have to extend the neck or you have to, um, you know, that's when, that's when complex Eva comes into play. Yeah. So these are the types of uh, poor necks. There's uh, the straight, you know, standard neck, you know, an angulated neck, a tapering neck, um, a conical neck, a bulgy neck, and just a short neck. So these are the types of unfavorable anatomies that we may well be using our complex repair for. Again, you know, this is just some data to show um, the um, uh, outcomes in relation to the neck length. So you can see if you have a nice long neck, there's actually quite a, um, you know, quite a low percentage of patients that end up with endo leaks uh, in, the, in the short and midterm at least. Okay, and if you have a shorter neck, then it's it's much higher. So the question is, how how do we extend the ceiling zone? Okay, because it's the lack of a ceiling zone that leads to problems later on. Okay, so if you look at there's different types of options. The one I'm going to talk about predominantly is a fenestrated stent. And, and um, in this case, what we're doing is we've got holes in the stent, which you can line up with the visceral vessels. It's a customized stent. Um, and hence, by going above these vessels, uh, you're able to extend the seal to a part of the aorta that has nice parallel uh, neck with with no thrombus and little disease. That, that's the idea. The other way to do it is to do a branch graft, which is very good for especially those thoraco abdominal type aneurysms. Fenestrated stent is more useful for more sort of paravisceral juxtarenal aneurysms. I'm not going to talk very much about iliac branch grafts um, because that's a slightly separate topic. The other way to extend the seal is to use a chiva. That's a chimney eva. So what you're doing here is you're um, essentially um, extending the, uh, the, the main stent to above the renal vessels and um, placing a stent within the renal vessels as well to maintain perfusion. And the two are kind of sandwiched together uh, to create, and that often does create a seal, even though you, you can get some leak from the dutters. Okay. Finally, I just want to mention that you can, you know, you can do fairly short necks with endo anchors as well. Um, you know, we just have to be wary though, because there's nothing like having a proper neck. I mean, that's what we really want to do is, is not compromise on that. And if, we have to use a very short neck. We should look at all the other options first. And if the patient isn't suitable for the other options, then I would maybe consider having a, a you know, short neck with a endo anchors. All right. I'm not going to say much more about endo anchors. Um, you know, it's it's a technique that uh, you know what we're doing is we're, we're screwing some uh, fixation devices into the graft from inside the graft into the wall of the artery. Um, in various positions of the of the um, uh, you know of the aneurysm neck, okay. Right. So fenestrated endovascular aneurysm repair. Um, these these this repair is as I've said done for aneurysms that come in very close proximity to the renal arteries or even go above the renal arteries, um, and it represents you know a fair proportion of all aneurysms, 10 to 15 percent. Um, and it's ideal for those where um, there's insufficient ceiling zone. Now, what do I regard as an insufficient ceiling zone? Well, I would say if it's less than a centimeter, okay, um, and definitely less than five millimeters, I would definitely go for, for a fenestrated repair. Um, when you get to sort of six or seven millimeters, it does become very you know, very, um, in terms of long-term seal, you're not going to get a good long-term seal with such a short aneurysm, but aneurysms grow. Um, and if you've only got six or seven millimeters, then the sealing zone will eventually 
um, efface, and then you'll be left with a, an endo leak. So the fenestrated, uh, I finished. Uh, oh yeah, so what happens with the fenestrated repair is that as, you have, as I've mentioned, you have holes within a stent, and these are, you know, these are obviously tailored to the patient's anatomy. Um, and then what we do is we place the stent and then we put small balloon expandable stents through the fenestrations to make sure we get a seal. And this is what it looks like. So you have, um, you can see that uh, there's a hole in the stent and you can see that the fenestration, fenestration and the, uh, the uh, small stent is going through that fenestration. And then what we do is we um, flare the end of the stent so that it kind of seals up against the main stent. Okay, so obviously part of the stent is going into the target vessel. The other part is protruding into the main stent and then you can flare that using a balloon. So it seals that, that sort of joint between the fenestration and the, and the stent. So, and, and we use different, these are all bridging stents. There's little stents that go through the fenestrations and there's different types. There's the atrium stent, which is the most popular, I think. And there's the B-graft stent, which is a uh, Bentley stent, we call it. Um, and there's Jotex stents as well. So there's different balloon mounted stents. And the good thing about these stents is they're very accurate and that's what you need. You need accuracy. Um, and you need to be able to place these stents really carefully so that a third of it is protruding into the, into the, into the main stent and two thirds is protruding into the actual uh, target vessel itself. There's different types of devices. And I, you know, I, I, I did this presentation a few years ago. I'm sure them, there, may, there are others coming onto the market, but the two that I'm most familiar with is um, the Terumo Anaconda device, which is one now that I use, you know, more or less exclusively. And then the Cook Zenith device, which I did use, you know, many years ago when I started out. Um, so just looking at the, the Terumo graft, um, it's based on the design of the uh, of the um, infrarenal device. And, and the theory behind this stent is that it has two ceiling rings, which are about five millimeters apart. And these go into the ceiling zone, okay? So with a, with a standard EVA, you need a centimeter and a half, and you put this in the ceiling zone, okay? And uh, it's built so that it has a, it's, it's, it's sort of got valleys and it's got peaks. That's the way the device is built. Um, and the idea is that as the aneurysm gets bigger, it can expand a little bit, okay? So the fenestrated device is exactly the same, but with holes in it, okay? And one thing about this graft is that it is a very, it's a very, it's, it's a very flexible device. It's not a supported device like um, Cook, which is, is, is more rigid and has got a frame. This, this is, the, basically, the body of this graft is just cloth. It's just dacron. Okay, so it's, you, know, you can put the fenestrations anywhere, really. So what we do with this one is that it, the device is such that you, um, uh, you know, you can actually. Um, it doesn't have a top cap, uh, unlike you know the the Medtronic and the Cook devices. They have a top cap. So when you release the top cap, it releases the the suprarenal, uh, you know, suprarenal. A non covered part of the stent. Yeah. But because this is an infrarenal device, it doesn't need that. So the top is open. And that has some advantages, it has some disadvantages as well, but it has some advantages. And the advantage is you can actually, before fully deploying the stent, you can actually cannulate the fenestrations from above. Okay. Um, which is quite convenient because it gives you that option. And I'll come to when you might want to do that. Um, it's also repositionable. So you can actually withdraw the collar and the, and the device will collapse and that will allow you to reposition it. Um, and that means that you can put up and down and you can move it in a rotational manner. The slight downside is that because it's not a very supported device, you can actually twist the graft itself, which can be a problem, yeah? So, one thing about this device is that these two ceiling, I, took, you know, you may, I mentioned these two ceiling rings. There's two ceiling rings. Now, if you want, if you've got a shorter ceiling zone, you can actually bring those two ceiling rings 
closer together at the front so that then you can get an even you can you can seal it in a smaller area okay, and i'll come to that in a minute and that's called augmentation okay so um the most important thing in my opinion for this type of um procedure is the planning the planning is the most important thing and i think if you want to do these types of cases you should really be prepared to because you're the one this is this is you're writing a prescription for this device effectively because it's off label so you're taking complete responsibility as a surgeon and if you've not planned it yourself or not had a role in the planning then you could you know you could be culpable so you need to be really sure so it's really i think it's also one of the most fascinating areas about this as well it's actually quite interesting the way the anatomy is and how you can plan the device so I would, I would really urge you to, you know, and the planners are very helpful and they, you know, will take into account what you've said. So it's really good to be part of the planning process. And, um, you know, that, and for that, you really need a good CT. And I would get a full CT of the, from the whole of the aorta, because if you're coming from the top, you need to know what the vessels are like you know, what the access is like from the top, you need to know if they've got thoracic aneurysm. Um, so I think I would definitely, you know, do a full CT and it has to be CT angiogram, not a CT for something else. Um, the, um, in the arterial phase. So in terms of the case planning, what, what we're really trying to establish is when you look at a, when you look at a CT you, for an EVA, there's, you should look at it from the point of view of looking holistically at the whole CT, making sure that the access is okay, that the, you know, the, the access vessels, the eyelid vessels look good. You know, you've got enough, you know, seven or eight millimeters diameter vessels that you can get a, a big graft into, because this has got a big graft. It's 24 French. Um, that you've got, um, you know, the, the, the neck of the aneurysm, the sealing zone, uh, that you, you're thinking of, of sealing in, you know, the tortuosity, the, you know, the angulation, um, you know, the, all these things you're looking at. And, and you're also looking at specific things for fever. So you want to find, the first thing you want to do in that sense is you want to find where is it that we can seal this aneurysm? Can we do a two-vessel fenestration and just seal it above the renals? And if that's the case, you need... 6.5 to 12.5 millimeters in diameter in, in length. And the reason why there's a range is that if it's a fully augmented device, you can have a shorter sealing zone. And if it's uh, not augmented, then you need a longer sealing zone. So you need a gap of 12.5 between the top of the renal arteries and the bottom of the SF SMA. And you'll be surprised how few cases there are that fit that tough criteria. Um, because this has to be nice, healthy, parallel neck. That's the, this is the holy grail of, of fenestrated EVA. No point spending all that money and time if you're sealing in the, in the poor zone, sealing zone. For a three vessel case, you need to have uh, 11 to 19.5 millimeters between the top of the SMA and the bottom of the celiac. Okay, so again, quite a lot. And that's why most Fenestrated aneurysm repairs nowadays, for this particular company anyway, tend to be a four vessel fenestration. Because above the celiac, usually you can find a nice zone to seal with, because there's no more branches until you get to obviously the, the great vessel at the, at the top. So the most important thing about FIVA is you, you need to be able to be really familiar with um, using uh, software, post-processing software, um, such as Terra Recon, um, Three Mencio, Vitria, there's lots of different companies and it doesn't really matter which one it is, as long as you're used to it. And um, I think that it's well worth, if you're interested in this type of thing, making sure that it's, it's not actually rocket science, it's actually quite simple and most of you are already using it and I'm sure will be more than capable of, of actually, you know, doing it. But it's a really it's really important to be able to use that software properly and get the most out of it. And we have to use um, the multiplanar reconstruction, the MPRs, which are normal built-in function that they have. Um, 
and you need to be able to you know um look at center line as well which what what, what it does is it creates a line in the center and then it can straighten the whole thing out for you so that you can actually measure you know particularly height measurements are very useful for that um, and really what you're looking at you're looking at quite um a number of measurements that you need to take in order to to do you know to do this type of thing and um you know, I've, I've got a sort of a, a spreadsheet with all the types of measurements you need, and I'll, I'll share that with you in a, in a couple of minutes. But um, there is a video on this, but I think it's going to be a bit too long, so I'm going to skip the video. And um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to design a graph. We're trying to, no, we're trying to take some measurements. The measurements need to be reproducible. They need to ideally be checked by somebody else, okay? Each graft costs about 15,000 pounds. I don't know how much that is in rupees, but I think that's a lot of rupees. Um, and what we need to do is we need to give those measurements so that the engineers in the, you know, the, the, the company that you're using, like in this case, Vascutech, can actually manufacture a graft for you, okay? And they do this, you know, it's, it's sort of an engineering drawing that they do, but this is a really, uh, this is a really nice sort of um, demonstration. I, I don't know if you can see everything. I'm, it's sort of, I'm trying to get rid of this. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. It. Yeah, very cool. You can see that. So, yeah, yeah. so what you do is you, what you're trying to do is measure everything from the bottom of the celiac. And then you're measuring from the bottom of the celiac to the top of the SMA, to the middle of the SMA, to the bottom of the SMA, to the top of the one renal, to the middle of the other renal, you know, middle of the renal and the bottom of the renal. So you're taking all those measurements in height wise. And then you're also taking the measurements from the clock face. In other words, you know, the angle that the vessel is coming off. So if you look at, if you just study this, um, this bit, for example, this shows that from the bottom of the celiac trunk to the top of the SMA is 12 millimeters, yeah, and so on. Also in these measurements, you measure the actual diameter of the vessel as well, because you'll have to choose what size bridging stent you need. So you need to know that diameter as well. And as, as I've said, the next thing is to measure the angle. This is the angle from the 12 o'clock position. So if you look at this one, if I just point to that, you can see the celiac, which is um, 21 degrees from the center. So it's offset, okay? And it usually is offset in that direction. Similarly, the left renal is 77 degrees and the right renal is 46 degrees, Oops, sorry. So th those are the measurements. And then you can do, um, you can then center, what we do is that when we're doing the actual EVAR itself, the FIVAR, we actually center it on the celiac. So then obviously the measurements, you know, will change slightly, um, but you know, you don't need to worry about that at this stage. Then what we do is when we get all those measurements, they can actually make a drawing, an engineering drawing with all those measurements, all those fenestrations there. So this, these two lines are, the ceiling rings. And this is, I think, an augmented one. Yeah, augmented valley. Can you see those bit? This bit in the middle is yeah. pinched. Yeah. Can you and explain then this what bit, is augmented? Sorry for interruption. What is augmented? Augmented is when you when you bring the rings, the ceiling rings, instead of being five millimeters apart, you bring them to two or three millimeters apart. Yeah. Oh. So that then you can seal the aneurysm. The neck in, in a smaller neck i should say yeah mm. so if you're going you know so this particular case we're doing a three vessel fenestration so we're putting the ceiling rings between the sma this one and the celiac so that zone in order to seal in that zone safely and have a little margin of error because you don't want to cover those vessels otherwise patient is dead so you know you you put you you put you augment the the the, the sort of ceiling zones the ceiling rings you bring them closer you pinch them together in the in the front of the graft yeah mm -hmm. so if I just quickly show you it's a good question so if you look at this one this is a standard valley yeah okay this is all this, this is looking at from the side by the way yeah. that's a normal two ceiling mm -hmm. rings parallel mm -hmm. if you look at the augmented one it's pinched at the front this is the front this is the back. Oh. Do you understand? Yeah. Explained. Have I explained that clearly? So basically, have I explained? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, good. So this is an augmented valley. Yeah. 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 And then the, obviously it widens out. So you can see that the celiac has been cradled by the valley. The SMA is in the middle and then the two renals there. Okay. Looking at the, what, what this particular, what they do, these are very clever. They, they actually print, do a 3D printout of the actual aneurysm. So you can actually practice putting a, a non-sterile graft into that and so that you can test that it works. Actually, to be honest with you, I don't think you really need it personally. If your planning is good enough, you don't need it. But I've got loads of these on my shelf. I wish I'd brought one where I've got all these aneurysms lying around in my on my on my desk. Mm. And everybody comes. Whenever I get a new SHO, they are very fascinated. Usually it doesn't last very long, that fascination, when they've done one case with me. Um, so it's um, you know, that that's the graft itself. Okay, you can see the little fenestration there. You can see a fenestration. No, that's the fenestration. And this is the actual 3D print. Okay, it's a model of the graft. Okay, now we talked about access a little bit. Now, a lot of the time you can do uh, do the do the access for when I when I talk about access, I'm talking about the access for um, the not the graft. The graft always has to go in through the the, the groin but the access for the fenestrations. Now, what we do is in, in Colchester and in many places, if we go from the bottom, we need to make sure that the anatomy is relatively straight, that the renal artery is a nice, a nice and sort of 90 degrees rather than very down going. There's good caliber iliac vessels on both sides and the aortic bifurcation is wide enough as well. Yeah. If, those things aren't the case. If you've got um, downgoing renals, it's actually quite difficult to come from the bottom and try to cannulate and track a, a, you know, a sheath into that as well. Yeah. So that's why downgoing renals are better treated going from above. If you've got an angulated neck, again, you know, trying to do that, align the graft. It's quite difficult if you're going from the bottom, accessing the vessels from the bottom, because if you do it, if you access them from the top, it allows you to deploy the graft slowly and gradually. And by not fully deploying it, it gives you torque. It allows you to reposition. It allows you to, you know, sort of move the device a bit. And that's quite useful. So if, if there's an angulated narrow neck, definitely I always come from the top. Okay, and I usually go from the left axillary artery, although really it's very inconvenient to do that from the patient's position. One other thing I just want to tell you, if you're doing these, just look after your radiation doses. You know, I, I, I have consumed a lot of radiation doing these types of cases. So look after yourself and make sure you don't take too much radiation. Okay, so to do this type of work, um, you need a lot of stuff. You need a lot of consumables. You need lots of sheets, wires, catheters, balloons, and of course the balloon expandable stents, in addition obviously to the main stent. And you need to get this all in one box and make sure nobody touches it when you're doing the case, yeah, before you do the case. Don't let anybody come and take something from it. Just guard it like a, a because you, 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 this, these are difficult cases. They take a long time. And sometimes you have to use different wires, different catheters, different sheaths. And you can be there for six or seven hours, you know, trying to make it happen. And if you do this, do not do it on your own. Do it as a team. Do it with a good, you know, person with good endovascular skills, whether that be a radiologist or a surgeon, it doesn't matter. Do it, you know, with at least two or three people around the table because Often one person will get tired and the other person will take over and just having the, you know, one you know, team approach will be very useful. Um, so I'm going to just go through the deployment sequence. I mean, um, what I might do is a bit easier. I might, I'll just show you a video, okay? Um, excuse me. Excuse me. There we go. So if I press this little video, um, this this is just a video from the company. Okay. 
If you have any question, please feel free to ask. Yeah, this is very interesting talk and uh, very nicely explained about the basics and the indication for that. I will encourage people to uh, uh, text their question and even they can ask. My question with Dr. Mr. Choksi is that if you have to select one of the auxiliary artery, which auxiliary artery would you be selecting, right or left? If left. both are normal. <laughs> Simply left because it's obviously when you can come down the subclavian and it's much straighter. You okay. don't have to go around the arch. You can go straight down the descending aorta, so it makes it easier. Whereas if you go from there, you've got much more of a you know going around the arch, mm. round and then down. It's, a lot of people do it though from the mm. from the right side, but if mm. it's easier to do it from the left. Uh, has so your you can, practice changed, for example, uh, uh, for fenestration EWAR? Or, uh, because that gives a good ceiling zone or it increases the operative time and complexity and you are very selective for doing a two, uh, two vessel PVAR or three vessel PVAR. We, we, we hardly do any um, two, three vessel PVARs anymore, to be okay. honest. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we hardly do it. Um, so, um, you know, four vessel fenestration seems because you know it's it's just you know the companies are much more conservative now. Mm. Uh, they they all you know they, they tend to be you know stick to the rules very very sharply. I mean, you can as a clinician override it, but you should listen to what they say. Dr. Okay. Umar is he has done uh, one fever and has experience in doing fever. Dr. Umar, do you have the experience of using this Anaconda device or having? using the cook device uh, no i've only got experience of uh, cook i've uh, mainly used cook and metronic mm -hmm. uh, devices uh, during my uh, during my career even in uk as well mm -hmm. um, anaconda uh, obviously um, i was there till 2015 mm -hmm. and there were a few centers which were using anaconda quite a lot but most of the centers were using metronic and cook and since I've come here, uh, we only have availability of Cook or Metronic. Uh, the fenestrated that we did was also a Cook device. Um, so it, it is, it is as, as Dr. Uh, Chok, uh, Mr. Choksi has said, it's a very complex uh, procedure. And the main thing lies in the planning. If you haven't planned mm -hmm. it well, then, um, then you are going to land in significant trouble during the procedure. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I completely agree with that. And it takes some time. For example, if we have to select, for example, between the chimney e war and the fenestrated, uh, if, which which will we be favoring, fever or it is the chimney? Are there going to be more of endo leaks uh, like this? So I think that, that it depends who you talk to. Uh, if you mm -hmm. talk to a chimney enthusiast, They'll tell you chimney. Mm -hmm. If you talk to someone who's more fenestrated based, it will be. I think, generally speaking, it's better to make a custom made device in a in a decent ceiling zone mm -hmm. um, than you know. Have, I mean, chimney is great if off the shelf. You don't have to wait for six to eight weeks for a graft to be manufactured. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got some advantages, but I think there's a limit to the number of chimneys you can really do. Okay, so if you've got you know if you need you know, if you if you need to, you know, if the aneurysm is extending above the renals, then you might end up having to put a lot of chimneys in. And there's a limit because if you, the more chimneys you have, the more chance you'll have of endo leak. Yeah. So it's fine for one or two vessel fenestrations, but I think anything more than that, I would be quite wary of using a chimney. Yeah. We have probably one question or comment from Sayyid Yusuf. Uh, hi, this is Vakhar Yusuf from Brighton. So, uh, uh, very good talk. I thought I'd just join in as well. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, this gentleman is the this is the is the father of fenestrated stents. So, I won't even say anything. I didn't realize he's joining. Otherwise, I would have uh, tried to be better. That so, lovely talk. Very good. Uh, just your question, uh, Zia, about the chimney, and I entirely agree with what Sohail is saying here about. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's a desperate sort of procedure. Uh, uh, you're making it more complicated in terms of getting proper seals, et cetera, with, you know, through the gutters. Um, it isn't, it's, uh, it's something, um, 
that people who are just interested in uh, getting something done and having a completion angiogram that looks okay is is fine. But it's, it's, uh, there are question, lots of question marks about. So no, uh, fever anytime, um, uh, and I think it certainly should not be. The one situation which is the urgent case where um, you know you really uh, haven't got the time to get a uh, uh, proper custom made device made. Uh, there you have to think carefully, uh, um, and you know uh, uh, it's not something I can recommend. But I, in Brighton, we would uh, we would bench fenestrate for these cases. So, um, but you, you need a lot of experience with uh, planned cases uh, before uh, getting into that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, uh, but yes, so no, if you are any time, so I'll stop here. So, so he'll stop. I shouldn't be uh, stepping in, but I thought I'll just make a comment. <laughs> I think that's a very well well said. Thank you very much for, for that answer, actually, Evelyn. So, so yeah. So, um, that, that this is a fenestrated case, which is a three fenestration fen fenestrated case. You can see there's a ceiling zone between the SMA and the celiac artery, and that's what we're aiming for here, in terms of a a place to seal. So, um, this is just uh, you know a sort of shows you what the neck is like. It's a very short neck, and you know if you've got such a short neck, you really don't want to be putting any type of infrared device whatsoever. In terms of this particular case, um, we uh, did a, did it via the right side, so you need to decide which side you're going to put the body up. And I tend to put most of the time I go via the right side, um, and the the trick is to really slowly deploy the graft, really really slowly. Because I think, in a way, although the more the fun bit is to do the fenestrations, the important bit is to line it up absolutely spot on. So you really want to make sure that you do a good angiogram and you look at the target vessels, you align the graft perfectly, okay, and then you deploy. And the problem you do have is that you can't see the markers of the fenestrations very clearly when you've got a constraint. So it's, it's, you know, you have to kind of, you have to kind of, you know, do that as you go along. And every time you do something, check it and then readjust the graft if necessary. Yeah. So um, in this particular case, we did a, we, we did a, a, a 12 French sheath for the actual fenestrations from the other side. Um, and uh, you know, I'll just show you the you know what the what it looked like if you know once we've got the graft aligned, and you can see that these are the the markers. Okay, so for this particular type of graft, and I I think that you know Cook and and Vascutec, I mean, there's not really they're very different graphs, but I think that results are very similar. I don't think one is any better than the other. I think it's more sort of personal choice. Um, but what we have here is that you can see that the graft is constrained and you can see th these are the two ceiling rings of the graft. There's got a little marker on the left side which orientates, has to be on the left side. And then you've got the other markers which you can see the left renal marker, the right renal marker, the SMA. The celiac is often hidden in there somewhere. And what you're doing is you're, you're one of the important things is to get these Markers very well aligned and superimposed. These are the valleys and the the uh, the peaks. That means you're rotationally aligned properly. Once a, the second thing is to align it from a height point of view. And what I tend to do is I tend to choose a vessel, whatever vessel it is, for example, the left renal vessel, and I make sure that the height is perfectly aligned to that. And obviously, look at the angiogram, and hopefully everything else should align if your planning has been good which it should be, especially with the help of the planners. So this is just uh, this particular graft, we've deployed it. And then we this is a 12 French sheath. And what we do is we put a, uh, uh, you know, some a, a catheter um, and a wire uh, up through the sheath. And often we, well, often we'll put a, a seven French sheath first and then put the, uh, you know, put the wire and the catheter through there. And then, you know, fenestrate, go through the fenestration into the target vessel, and uh, and then uh, you'll then you know you then put the wire. And often, 
I will actually put all the wires in first, but it, it's very variable. You know, sometimes you complete, you know, one stent and then you move on to the other. Some people put all the wires in at the beginning. Some people put a couple of wires in, you know, it's, 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 it depends on the case. And I think you have to be flexible in this, in this situation. Um, so, uh, so at this point, we, what we did everything from below. So what we did is we cannulated the contralateral limb, put this 12 French sheath in, then cannulated the left renal. In this case, what we do is once you cannulate it, you have to put the catheter over obviously the wire that you cannulated, and then you put a more stiffer wire through. Now, I don't know what, what car uses. I, I tend to use Amplat super stiff one centimeter tip wires, but there are other wires. Rosen wires are, are, are the ones that are the most commonly, were the common, most commonly used. I don't know if they still are, but you know, Rosen wires, sometimes you can use a Jindo wire, although they've stopped making them. A Jindo wire is a, is a tapered wire. Some people use an Advantage wire, which is like a hybrid wire. So there's different types of wires that you can use um, in this situation. And it's just a personal preference that you're happy with and not too much variation, stick to what you're good at. And, and, and then in this case, we did the SMA. You have to, you know, we have to orientate the II, the image intensifier, according to the, uh, the, the um, sort of type of the, the, the fenestration that you're looking at. So for the SMA fenestration, you need to ideally have it as lateral as possible. And you can, you know, it does depend if, if the SMA is, um, you know, not at night, not at 12 o'clock position and it is a bit out, then you have to then, you know, put it, put the, put the II in a slightly different position. Um, and by that, I mean rotationally. So if, if, for example, the SMA is in the, in the 12 o'clock position, in, ideally you want to have the II in the lateral position. So you can see the thing on FES and you can cannulate the vessel um, and then do the angiogram. So this is with the, um, the wire through, you put it nice and deep into the, um, into the vessel. Um, and then you can then um, push the catheter and then the, 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 sort of the sheath and then the stent into the sheath itself. Because what you don't want to do is you know, put this balloon mounted stent, you know, naked without having a sheath because otherwise it'll just come off. So you need to put it within a sheath. And the sheath basically goes, you know, into the actual target vessel by about you know, three or four centimeters, something like that. Um, and when you're doing that, you have to be very careful not to damage the vessel. So um, once you've done that, once you've put your sheath and you've placed the stent and you've positioned it well, it's a matter of then inflating the actual balloon from the, from the stent, and then the stent obviously then deploys. Um, and then you have to do the flaring that I talked about, where you um, put, a, put a balloon um, just into the stent and use a, a small balloon, a 20 millimeter balloon. You inflate that, and what that does is, it, um, as I've said before, it flares the end of the stent against the main stent. So this is again, just a quick view of, of um, th this is actually the right renal fenestration that we were doing. This was a difficult fenestration. Um, we, we used a SOS catheter to get inside and um, you know, the SOS catheter is great cannulation catheter as I'm sure you know, but when it comes to tracking, it's not very good or it's very difficult. So, you know, we, we had to end up taking the SOS out and putting a, uh, in fact, we used, um, we used a, a tour guide, um, a, um, a steerable sheath to get into this particular um, sort of uh, target vessel, which is the right renal. It's a very down going vessel, as you can see. And that's, again, you know, if you're coming from above, it makes it a bit easier to get into those types of vessels. So these are the types of problems that you can get. The catheter sometimes doesn't track, um, you know, um, you know, you something, and often it's a matter of trying different things to make it work. Um, you know, sometimes you have to change the catheter to a better one, um, something that tracks easily, like a, a full French hydrophilic glide catheter is a good one. Um, sometimes you have to actually build up the stability, and you can use V18 wires, and you can put three wires into the actual um, target vessel, and that builds up the stability so that then you can put a sheath across it, a sheath into it. 
Um, sometimes it's a matter of the, the, the graft is just out and you have to be brave and just slightly twist the graft. You're able to do that if you've got, if you've still got some torsion within the, the stent itself. Different views, different person trying it. Um, using a balloon sometimes can be helpful so that you can go into the fenestration and then as you deflate the balloon, you can push the sheath through that. Um, and as I said, we can use a steerable sheet catheter. Often what happens in these situations is that you're concentrating so much on the fenestration, you don't see what's happening below. And sometimes the, the catheters and wires and sheets and whatever, they all just get sort of uh, uh, big loops in them. And that means that you can't really get the torque that you need. This is just a steerable sheath tool guide, which is a very useful tool to have on the side. We don't use it for every case. We just use it selectively when we need it. So um, these are the types of things that sometimes you come across, um, you know, and as I've said, it's a matter of having, you know, as a, you know, I'm sure that Wakar has said this to me, you need to have a plan A, you need to have a plan B, you need to have a plan C. You just need to have different tricks to get out of the situation. And often having more than one or, you know, having a couple of people there, they'll allow you to try different, different techniques to make it work. So um, this is just, uh, oh, this is just um, a situation where we had a bit of an endo leak. And in this situation, um, we tried ballooning it, we tried flaring it. And in the end, sometimes you just have to put another stent inside it, um, you know, just to extend it proximally. What, what you want to do is you want to have enough of a bit of bridging stent inside to seal it and flare it and have enough outside to get the seal into the target vessel. So you need to make sure sometimes when you're deploying these things, and especially if you're manipulating sheaths within the, the stent itself afterwards, the stent can get pushed out um, and you know pushed out into the target vessel. And in that situation, it's not a big problem. You just have to put another stent within the stent and that usually will solve the situation. Um, so this is just, um, we just extended it and this is a flaring. This is what we call by flaring. We blow up the short balloon. It's a two centimeter balloon, which is 10 or 12 millimeters. And you just flare it and it just, you know, sort of fixes it against the, the stent itself. Um, so in terms of the results from FIVA, I mean, there is no golden randomized trial. People have, you know, some, I would say that fenestrated EVA has got a lower mortality than an open repair, I think, you know, certainly in my hands. But I think there are others who argue that, you know, for a standard juxtaposition aneurysm repair, there's not much difference. But the thing about FIVA is you don't just use it for a, a juxtaposition repair. You use it for aneurysms that are super renal as well. And those types of repairs are very different. Those types of repairs are type four repairs. And I think, you know, you can't, you're not, you need to compare apples with apples and not apples with oranges. So it's very important to, to make sure. And I think what we really need is, is, a, is some kind of trial that looks at the anatomy and matches the anatomy for anatomy, rather than just saying this technique is better than that technique. Because it's, it's you know, that technique can be used to treat so many other uh, types of things. So um, in terms of, um, I don't know, um, I've run over a bit. Uh, do you want me to continue or would you like me to stop there? It is great to actually talk where you can continue. If there's any question, one question is from Dr. Farid uh, is regarding axillary excess. Is it always open cut down or could it can be percutaneous as well? I always use open cut down. I don't think it's safe to put a percutaneous cut down in an axillary area. I've, yeah. I've never done it. I think you have to be very brave to do that. Yeah. I wouldn't do it. Just a short smear incision below the clavicle. Good, good practice for the registrar to get an axillary out of it. And you've got a, you, know, you only need two or three centimeters. That's my practice. I don't know what what car does, I, um, but I certainly never cut. I always, I, I always agree, cut. agree, Suhail. Agree, Suhail. I mean, there are people who have reported. I think Oxford they've reported uh, percutaneous access and closure, uh, but it's a very fragile artery, and uh, and if you run into difficulty, then uh, it's it's much better to have control. I, I I would I do what Suhail is saying. Exactly. So, uh, any other questions? Sorry, I'm not looking at the chat. No. Yeah, there's no question in the chat. Okay. And that is good. 
just stop me when you when you want to because I you know uh, um, I've done the main talk. There's a little bit I'm going to talk about chimneys and, and other stuff, but I don't have to if you don't want me to. Just let me know when you run out of time. Okay. That is great talk. Actually, we we'll want to listen. Actually, that is okay. excellent. Thank you for that. Thank you. So although there's no randomized control trial, this is old data. I'm sorry, I haven't really updated this fully, but there is a good uh, trial that was published in the circulation, uh, you know, journal, which looked at um, Global Star Registry. And they basically looked at lots of cases, 318 cases in, in the UK. And they found that there was quite good procedural success with fever. And what they did is that they looked at the, the period of mortality was 4% for fever. Um, and that's 11 deaths in, in that cohort. And what they did is they looked at what the VPOSSUM score was and what the predicted mortality would have been for open repair. And that was predicted to be 11. So they said the tentative risk reduction was 7%. Now that's, you know, people could criticize that as being sort of, you know, pseudoscience, but there is some, there is some method in that. And it's actually quite useful just to be able to get that sort of idea. And I, I personally think that, you know, fenestrated repair is sort of, in my opinion, is, is still lower mortality. Um, and I would say it's halfway between EVA and you know, an open type of thing. It's sort of that, that type of range. It's, it is definitely higher mortality than standard EVA. But I think it's, to, in, my, in my mind, it's, it's, it's lower mortality than an open repair. But again, you know, you need to match it case to case. So this is just, uh, you know, looking at the target vessel patency. I think the thing here is, is that target vessels are lost late, you know, after two, you know, after two years, three years. So you have to keep surveillance in these patients because they do have an attrition rate. And the same for, um, yes, yes, the same for um, interventions that, you know, you do have to re-intervene and you have to be prepared to re-intervene for these patients to extend a renal stent or, you know, to, to you know, to, to do another flaring of, of you know, the thing of, of one of the uh, the target vessels, or you know, there might be a, a leak, you know, from somewhere else, or there might be a kink. So there's there is definitely a reintervention. These are complex stents, and you have to be re ready to reintervene. Um, so I think I think that um, you know, when Nice looked at this, they said that you know there is a difference, um, and that the you know the favor of fever group. But again, you know, this is relatively small numbers, in my opinion. Um, you can use branch grafts as well, um, especially if the aneurysm goes above the sort of mid visceral level. You know, if, if you're going above the celiac, I think the thracoabdominal, it really becomes a thracoabdominal aneurysm. And branch grafts are very, very good for, you know, things like that, because you, you can cannula everything from above and it's hanging down you know the branches are hanging down, so you know it's it's a it's a good technique, and you know it's it's sort of uh, you know used quite a lot in thoracic centres. We don't do it here in Colchester because we're not really a thoracic centre, um, but you know it's 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 good for treating any thoracoabdominal aneurysm. Um, it has a, a low mortality compared to open repair. Um, you know, TVAR mortality is less than ten percent. Um, the one thing that you do get or you can get is spinal cord ischemia. And I think that that's something that, you know, we, you need to be ready for in your center if you're doing this type of work. And, uh, you know, if you look at the comparisons between open repair and, uh, and TVAR, um, in fact, no, sorry, this is TVAR, the, the chances of your spinal cord ischemia does depend on the coverage, obviously, of the aorta that you're covering. So, you know, if, you're, if you've got a, an extensive coverage, for example, in a, you know, type, uh, you know, one to three, then your spinal cord ischemia rate will definitely be higher than if you're just doing a type four repair. So, you know, it's, it's important to take that into account and to plan your cases to, to maybe do it in stages. Um, I have some experience with, with the T branch. You know, I did a short fellowship in Malmo and we, you know, we sort of, I, I watched a few uh, fevers when I was there and participated in a few fevers. This is just one case. So it's just, uh, I mean, I personally, I think in the UK, we probably would have just done a fever on that, but they did a, 
the Tiva. And there's also a right iliac aneurysm as well there. So this is what a Tiva looks like in an angiographic um, on, uh, on image intensifier. You can see these branches coming out, hanging like a Christmas tree, which you can calculate from above. And you need nice long stents like, you know, fluency stents or something like that, so which can cross a long, long area. And then the, the end of it, you can use a sort of a non-covered stent just to seal, taper the end of it. Um, this is just, um, you know, one of the vessels being cannulated, I think it's the renal, left renal. In terms of spinal cord prevention, protection, um, you want to try to preserve as much, you know, collaterals as possible. If you don't have to cover the um, left subclavian, don't cover it. Um, you know, try to maintain the patency of it if you are, you know, by doing a, um, a bypass. Um, uh, you know, carotid subclavian bypass, um, trying to maintain the internal iliacs whenever you can, minimize embolization, stages of procedures, um, you know, make sure blood pressure is not too low, keep these patients in, in HDU, make sure you've got a spinal drain ready if you need it, maintain the blood, the mean arterial pressure above 80, um, good oxygen delivery, good, you know, hemoglobin. In a lot of cases, Spinal cord ischemia will resolve with these things, but sometimes you do need a spinal drain. And you know, that if you're doing sort of TVARs, you definitely need to be in a place where you can do these types of drains. Although some people have, you know, don't do them very often and certainly only do them when required rather than prophylactically. I'll just say one or two words very quickly about chimney. As Wakar said, it's not my best option. I think it's a temp it's a good, you know, it's a sort of a good temporizing solution then it's good if you haven't got time to you know order a stent which takes about four weeks um, but you know it is it is a useful technique to know and I think one of the applications of that I've seen in is you know when you've accidentally covered a renal during an EVA being able to do a chimney is actually quite a good skill to have and now it's it's relatively you know Medtronic have got quite a good system you know and they've got good training and teaching about it so it's quite a good you know, good stent to use um, the Medtronic along with a, an atrium or a, a B graft. Um, if you do use a B graft, make sure you have a reinforced one. And so chimney is, is basically what you're doing is putting a stent parallel to the main aortic stent just to maintain the patency so that the stent can go higher. And again, as I said, it's not useful for you if you need to go very high because you can't put too many chimneys in because of the risk of, of endo leaks or gutter leaks, I should say. Um, and um, yeah, so it's 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 a good bailout procedure, I'd say. Uh, access always from the top. Um, one thing about this technique is you need to you know you, you you position the stents, and when you inflate them, you need to use a kissing technique so that you're not collapsing the the the, uh, the, um, the bridging the uh, stent in the chimney, the chimney stent. And this is kind of what it looks like, you know, when you've gone from above. There's different types of chimneys. There's the snorkel chimney, which is the most common chimney where, you know, the, 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 the chimney stent is poking from the top. You know, that's the typical one that when you're sealing the renals. But you, you can get a periscope stent as well. If you're coming from above and you're wanting to, you know, the aneurysm is above those target vessels, then you'd have to put the, um, the, um, uh, chimney stent from the bottom as a periscope technique. And sometimes it's in between the two. I've never seen in between the two, but I'm sure there is a reason why that's there. So this is just, I think this is just a case that I did some time ago. Um, you're just trying to, I think it was a single fenestration into the left renal. Um, And uh, you know, you, you put the you can you, I don't know if you can see this, but you can see the the um, stent within the sheath, a six seven French sheath, um, and you've got this all positioned. The stent is positioned, and uh, you know now it's a matter of now deploying the stent um, and then doing the ballooning of both of them. So so now you've. Uh, deployed the, the stents, and the next part is to balloon the stents. And you can't see it, but both of them are being de 
ballooned at the same time to get that seal. Okay. So that's chimneys. So I've covered fever. Um, you know, we've talked a bit about uh, about branch grass, and obviously I've talked a bit about chimneys. As I said, you can, you know, there are adjunctive techniques that you can use to optimize an EVA. For example, I mentioned uh, putting staples in. I personally don't like that, that argument. I think it's better to have a decent seeding zone and use a FIVA rather than sort of uh, in terms of long-term seal. If you've got a patient who's only going to be alive for a couple of years, fine. It's good to put a, a standard EVA and put, you know, a few staples in there. But I think if you want to, if you've got someone younger, then I would definitely go for a definitive treatment. And for me, there's only two definitive treatments, an open repair or a fever. I think everything else to me is a temporizing procedure. So when you talk about complex aneurysms, you need to have really, really good planning. I think you need to really be prepared to spend the time planning and working with the planners. They're very knowledgeable and very good, usually quite keen people because they like working with clinicians. They don't get out of the office very much. There's a good chance for them to talk to clinicians. Um, Make sure you've got lots and lots of consumable um, uh, consumables, lots of catheters, lots of wires, you know, just have everything, you know, you could possibly need and make sure that you don't have the contingency plan A, B, C, D, um, have a good team together, a good team that works together, who supports each other, have breaks in these long cases, make sure you don't get exposed to too much radiation, um, be aware of the different techniques and, um, and I think I think that um, you know there is there is you know nowadays if you're doing a fever you need to do it make sure that there's good governance arrangements around it that you monitor the cases that there's good consenting process pa patients understand that there's you know the evidence is is you know for long term results for e fever isn't there but you know is developing but it's not there so you know I think I think that's something that you need to have that conversation with the patient um, and. Um, and you know, always re remember open repair as, as being a good, you know, a good technique if you're happy to do it. Um, it is a very, very expensive technique, as I've mentioned. Um, it, you know, stent itself costs fifteen thousand pounds. Each of the grafts costs the, the small grafts cost about a thousand pounds each. You know, the bridging stent. So, you know, we're talking about thirty to forty thousand pounds, you know, of, of cost. So you need to kind of make sure that you're doing it in a patient who will benefit from it. All right, thank you very much. That's me. I'm sorry, it's a bit long. Oh, that was an excellent talk, I will say, and I really thank for you taking precious time and preparing and presenting this. That has really actually cleared our concept. Uh, I see the hand is uh, initially after Dr. Uh, Avocat and then now oh, Dr. Fried. So we can start with Dr. Fried. G. Dr. Fried. Thank you very much, Mr. Chokthi and uh, Dr. Zia. I think that was a wonderful talk, really uh, enjoyed it. So I've just a couple of basic questions, uh, might sound silly to you, but you said for the balloon mounted stents, uh, you prefer to advance the sheath into the branches and then uh, advance the balloon, uh, the, the stent because it might just come off. But when we do it for the iliac, uh, uh, like the common iliacs as a kissing stent, and when we use balloon mounted stents there, we don't really advance sheaths forward uh, into the aorta. So what is the reason for doing it here? I think that, uh, I mean, these are really, you know, the thing is that you're, you're having to track um, a, you know, you're having to track a stent through, a, you know, through a graft, through the iliac, through a graft, into a fenestration, and the fenestration into the body. So there's lots of opportunities for the, you know, for the balloon mounted stent to come off. And I've seen it, I've actually seen it happen. So whereas the iliacs, you know, you might have a bit more, you know, there's not as much, there's not as many opportunities for it to come off. But I mean, ideally with any balloon mounted stent, ideally you should always put in a sheath in my opinion. But you know, if you're very experienced and you're really, really good and you're not going to get into trouble, that's fine. But as, as a precaution, it's always better to put it through a sheath, I would say. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, thank you very much. So my next question is, you said for the branch graft, it's relatively easier to cannulate the branches. So uh, how does that help compared to the fenestrations? Why is it easier through the branches compared to the fenestrations? 
So I think I think that um, <clears throat> so with with a with a fenestration, you're having to line up the, the the stent exactly to the patient's anatomy, and you know you you know if it's lined up perfectly, there's no problem. But if it is not lined up properly, then you, you know you might have some shuttering, um, and so it can be tricky to actually get through. Whereas if you're you know if you've got a branch graft, I mean it's great for cases in which there's a big but the aneurysm where you where there's there will be a big distance between the fenestration and the target vessel. If there's a big gap, then a then a, a fenestrated graft is of yeah is not going to be as useful because you'll have to bridge that big gap. Yeah. So it's it's better in those cases to have a branch graft. So you know the the, the you know the, the wires and the catheters can go outside the the actual um, yeah, the actual uh, um, you know in, into the sac and into the into the, the vessels themselves. So there's you know there's more space if you like to be able to maneuver it. But having said that, and I don't have much experience as much experience in branch graft, it can still be challenging. I'm sure you know to actually get into those vessels um, but I think I think that the, the difference is that in this case you don't really have much space between the fenestration if you if you've not lined it up properly it, become, it can become quite difficult and uh, you know you're having to go you know th you know through the fenestration and often 90 degrees to you know to get into the artery or even a more acute angle so it, it can be difficult whereas if you're coming from the top everything is just sort of you know is below you yeah more in line I think yeah thank you yeah, just one last thing. Uh, uh, have you ever come across a situation where you were unable to finish the procedure, like fever, doing all the branches, and then what's the way forward? So I think that okay. So if if you if you if right, I, I think the thing to do to answer that question is, if the case has gone on a long time, and you can't fenestrate a vessel, right. and you've tried hard. You're tired. Your team says stop. Okay. Usually you can stop and come back. Okay, and do it the next day. Yeah. Okay. It might not be possible if you've committed yourself with something like, for example, it's half deployed or whatever. But so often, if you just can't get into a vessel and you can't fenestrate it, usually you can leave it overnight, a day or two, and then come back and have another go. Because sometimes just the next day, something you know it just becomes easier. Because often the patient will be asleep for six, seven, eight hours. You know, long time. You know, physiologically, the patient you know has had enough. You've had enough. So sometimes it's best to take a break. I've never been in the position, luckily, that we've not been able to get in. Um, but I think I think that you know, I, you know, it, it does happen from time to time, and I think you need to. You know, you need to sort of step back and say, there's no major endo leak at the moment. Even if there is a little endo leak, it'll stay overnight. Leave it for the time being and come back the next day or come back in a couple of days. I don't know what Rakao will, very much. Rukav, Rukav will be able to answer, because he's probably done millions of these, so he'll be able to, I don't know what he, his practice is. <laughs> well, no, exactly, Suhail, your, your point that sometimes, you know, a, you're exhausted. It's a, it's there's a huge amount of fatigue uh, in these procedures mentally and physically, and and sometimes you get to a point where things are not happening. If it's uh, fenestration, you can't you can't connect. You can't get through the fenestration into the target vessel, and you've tried enough, and it's getting you know uh, it's becoming a very long procedure. Stop. You can always come back, and you might think about having some other things. You might have the steerable sh sheath. Uh, you know, Aptus sheath is a seven French sheath, very useful. Uh, it uh, not only gives you the right sort of angle you need, but also stabilizes so that you can advance the stiff wire through without uh, the catheter being distracted and so on. So it's often due to malalignment. That's the problem. Uh, so do, you know, do a stop and come back and, 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 and do that. In a desperate situation where you can get through the fenestration, but somehow the target vessel is completely in the wrong way. And that really is what Swale is saying. It doesn't happen because you're planning is usually the company would not give you a graft, which you know is totally uh, uh, you know um, uh, wrong in terms of its planning. So the uh, if the other vessels have aligned, they will all fit together. So you know, so that shouldn't happen. But if for some reason there is a problem, you leave it, come back another day. Uh, and I had a patient where uh, he was uh, on on dialysis, long term dialysis, but producing some urine, 
And the ride to renal artery was very awkward and I thought I'll preserve it and I could not. So I plugged the fenestration with an Amplars plug. And that was two, three years ago. And uh, that Amplars plug actually moved. So he then had a leak through the renal fenestration, which was not connected. So in fact, about two weeks ago, uh, recently I went back and, uh, and this time I just managed to get into the renal and connect it. So it's just coming back another day when you're not tired. It's not at the end of a long procedure. You've got other things with you. So that's something you can do. Um, um, and uh, just another point about the evidence. So for complex aneurysm in UK, the NVR shows a mortality close to 20%. And of course, you know, you're not comparing like with like, because if it's a juxtarenal with a short neck and you can get an infranal clamp in a fit young man, you know, go for open repair. Uh, but for the more UK is close to 20% on the NVR. And these are sort of figures which haven't changed. And with PVAR, it's about between 2 and 3%. So there is a, a difference. And we are uh, going to hear from the COMPASS trial, which is a big uh, UK trial looking at dextrorenal aneurysms and PVARs. It will be reported at the Vascular mm -hmm. Society meeting in November. And, and, and they're also looking at uh, you know, nearly 8,000 CT scans as part of the project to try and compare like with like what Suhil was saying about you know, anatomically comparable patients, how they fare. So we will have some more evidence uh, in the coming months. Well, that's very useful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Choksi and also Dr. Wakar. These are very valid points. And uh, Dr. Mitha, thank you again, Dr. Choksi, for making such a relevant and very specific uh, presentation. We in our setup is actually finding num one, number one is the issues of training and number is to see the centers where we can offer these interventions. And uh, I do not know how to deal these issues. Uh, first is uh, probably first will be the simulation and then going forward. We have some question or comment from Dr. Umar. Uh, not a question. I just wanted uh, to thank uh, Dr. Tox, uh, Mr. Toxi and also uh, Mr. Bukhar Yusuf uh, for participating and for giving us uh, such a good um, talk on this uh, complex aneurysm. So it's just something which uh, has taken me back to my years in UK, uh, where we used to do these things quite frequently. Um, and um, I think listening to this talk has just made me realize how much I miss these uh, complex situations. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great, yeah, it's a great team effort, isn't it? When, when it works. Um, but I think, I think that it is as, you know, as, as Vakar said, it's actually quite tiring as well. And, you know, it's sort of, <laughs> I think, I think that uh, you have to have a team approach because you, 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 you know, get very tired in these cases and, big head you know, lead, lead gown and everything but yeah it's great when i mean when it all comes together and you're doing a case and it's you know you know the, the technical sort of side of it is, is really really appealing that's why one of the reasons i really enjoy enjoy it but um yeah i think i think that you know using simulators is a very good way of learning um and i think that you know we often pra practice on the models that they give and you know you can just take that put under, under x-ray machine and you know, just sort of um, cannulate them. I've got a few of them. If, if, if you want, I can send them to you and you can just practice these cannulations and, and you can do that and just, you know, without any, hardly any exposure. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a good way of learning and, and getting the techniques. I think, I think it's, it's good to have a formula, um, you know, you know, how you do these things. And once, once you've done it a few times, that, that becomes second nature, you know, the way you, you know, move the sheets and the wires and, you know, but it's it's yeah. I think it's, like anything, it's just practice. And but I think I think that you know, there's a lot of other stuff that you know that, that can be done without as much radiation and expense. You know that you know vascular surgeons do. You know a lot of the work we do doesn't require as you know as much. I mean, developing a sound EVAR program is probably a good basis before you start tackling these more difficult cases. Um, so as a, as you know, I think that would be the first thing is to get a mature program going and, and perhaps, you know, um, and then, you know, moving on to the next stage. That's what I did in my own training. In fact, work I actually took me through my first EVA in 2007. So, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. 
So that is great. Actually, for the sake of time, I say we can, uh, we'll definitely, TFC uh, will listen to you and go through your cases and we'll uh, love to actually listen and learn from you. And same is with Dr. Wokar. And um, probably today, if there's no question or comments, we can stop here. I know that is very tiring day for Dr. Choksi. He has, in a very short notice, made this wonderful presentation and uh, he's always available. And thank you, uh, Mr. Choksi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we cannot yeah. say uh, more than that. And um, thank you, everyone, for participating. And inshallah, we'll meet uh, next month uh, uh, with a talk. Dr. Bukhar is actually talking on aortic dissection. And uh, that will be a great talk to listen. Inshallah, uh, I will send the time and the day for that. And thank you for that. Um, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank well, you very well, much. Well. Thank you Jaffa, for organizing Thank it. Thank you, Valikum. Oh, thank, thank you, Gaya, and thank you. Go ahead. Sound. Pleasure. Thank you.